Thank you both very much. And now we get into it. Uh, so I'm going to ask a couple questions, and then we're going to open it up for uh, your questions. And do we have a mic for when yes. people do begin to talk? So uh, my first question for both of you, taking Jeffrey Rose to heart, that your job, our job as scientists, is to summarize and present the evidence, and that it is the job of citizens, taxpayers, voters, parents to make the policy decisions based on that evidence. I wonder if you could uh, answer this question so that when someone asks the people who are here today, when their grandmother or their 12-year-old asks them, uh, what did you talk about today, they can answer. And the question is this. In a court of law, the assumption is uh, innocent until proven guilty. And in public health, <coughs> Uh, we put forth a different principle, the precautionary principle, which is that substances should be proven safe uh, before uh, the population is exposed. And so taking that precautionary principle, I wonder if you could each say, so that the people here can explain to their 12-year-old uh, or their grandmother, what should we do about salt based on the uh, precautionary principle? Start with that. The, um the, as I, that's why I mentioned this idea of the, uh, the tendency of policy debates is towards inaction. And the tendency is for people to have a standard for proof to be extraordinarily high before we take any action. It, it should be beyond, not just beyond a reasonable doubt, but beyond any doubt before we take any action. And I would argue that uh, the really, the, the question, that the standard should be preponderance of evidence. Does, you know, most of the evidence say that it's safer to be here than there, and if most of the evidence says that we should be here than there, then maybe we should, then we should go here, and I think we should recommend that we go here. Uh, and so, uh, to me, the, the, uh, the, the data are compelling that the preponderance of evidence is that our uh, sodium consumption now is far in excess to what it ought to be, and so we ought to be, a, and, and we should not take the status quo as as the default, and it must, you know, therefore, it must be optimal because we're all okay. We haven't, we don't have heart disease, do we? Uh, and so we should act. So, but let me. I'd have a, a question for Sandro that maybe he could answer as he answers the rest of the question. And that is, you, know, you had all these papers listed as pro, and then others as quote con. Uh, but did the con papers show that lowering sodium levels increased cardiovascular disease risk or increased all-cause mortality, or simply that they didn't decrease it? Because if you have 60% of papers say that it decreases it, and 40% say, well, it didn't decrease it, then that doesn't imply there's anything dangerous about this. Uh, and so that would tend to lead you more towards uh, acting and reducing sodium consumption. Yes, yeah, so let me, I'll, I'll address Dr. Farley's question first, and then I'll address Dr. Freudenberg's question. Um, um, so the, the answer is the latter, what you suspected, which is that the 40% of papers say it, uh, it didn't decrease it. And I actually don't think that that's where my concern about harm is. My concern about harm comes from the Cochrane reviews that talk about lipid shifts, which is in and of itself a whole other set of discussions about how robust that is. So, but, so, but I think the key to Dr. Farley's comment is that ultimately this is about the balance of evidence. And, and at which point do reasonable, rational analysts consider the evidence balance to have tipped one way or another? I, I, um, I brought up my disagreement with the climate change analogy, but in some respects it's an instructive analogy because it, it strikes me that it's hard for reasonable, rational people to disagree with evidence which is 97.3 in one direction. It strikes me as not that difficult for reasonable, rational people to disagree when the evidence is 60-40 in one direction. But however, that is just me making a statement which ultimately is subject to interpretation. I can turn back to Dr. Farley and he'll say, well, 60-40, that's one way or another, and et cetera. So without getting into that debate, going back into the precautionary principle, which I think framed this question, I, um, I think we should be clear in our recognition that the precautionary principle holds public health and public health practice to a far higher standard than we hold industry in this country, just to focus on this country. In that, while we hold ourselves to the standard that says that anything we do should be doing no harm, we should not be adding anything that has any chance of harming any, anybody, well, industry practices are far, are held to a far lower standard and regulation is a far more stringent uh, criterion than it's that. Now, I think we can decry that, but at the same time, we can't have it both ways because we accept that in part because we expect that our pronouncements 
are accorded the gravity they deserve and they are accorded the respect they deserve as having come from a place of deep deliberation and careful thought. It is the latter that concerns me about our engagement in this particular issue. It is the latter that concerns me about our opportunity lost to tackle issues which are far clearer in my assessment of literature, which are just as, if not more harmful, about which we have been largely silent because, for many reasons, but in part because we've been focusing on other areas which are not so clear. Great, and you set me up nicely for my next question. I do what I can. Uh, <laughs> and I know that the uh, two of you would be disappointed if I didn't ask about the food industry and its role. And uh, as, as you mentioned, Dr. Farley, at least uh, some of the research that finds no harmful effects from salt has been funded by the salt industry. And with some of that funding disclosed and some not disclosed. Uh, and we know from uh, reviews of the literature in other sectors of the food industry and in the pharmaceutical industry that industry-sponsored research is much more likely to absolve products of harmful effects than independent research. And just to, as well as uh, David McCarran, who you listed, uh, Dr. Suzanne Operill, who is the former president of the American Heart Association and the American Society of Hypertension, uh, and a key participant in these debates has been funded by the SALT Institute. Uh, Andrew Logan, who's on the faculty at Mount Sinai, is a paid consultant of the SALT Institute and a scientific advisor to the International Life Science Institute. And their technical committee on sodium, which has also been an active participant in the debate, is uh, funded entirely by the food industry, by Frito-Lay, Nestle, and Pepsi. Lori Roman, who's the executive director of the SALT Institute, is the former executive director of the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, which is an organization sponsored by corporations and right-wing political groups. So the question is how, Sandro, how do scientists and researchers think about that issue? And do you think uh, that some of those 40% of the studies uh, you would be influenced by knowing whether they were funded by the SALT Institute or not? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's, a, it's a good and perhaps a natural question. I think it's easy to uh, criticize you know, the Frito-Lay endowed chair in obesity research. Um, uh, the, um, and, and I think we have a, in some respects, a, a reflexive um, skepticism about the validity of any science that is sponsored by industry, particularly when it's an industry that is involved in that area, and I think it's reflexive skepticism that is borne out by quite a bit of empirical research. Um, so two comments on this. Number one is I actually don't know the extent to which um, um, any salt industry influence would influence any of that body of research. I have not looked at it, I don't know. Um, but I, I, uh, I, I think we, and by we here, I'm, I mean the population health scholarship community, <laughs> broadly writ, which involves those in the academy, those in public health practice, and those in the, in the community groups that are interested in promoting population health should hold ourselves to a higher standard of skepticism about bias than one that simply says it's biased if it's influenced by industry. I think there are many, many factors that influence scientific publications. I think um, your intellectual community's opprobrium is as much as a bias as is any potential source of funding. And when one has a system where you have siloed opinions that are breeding generations of researchers that are citing each other and doing the same thing. It is very difficult for any investigator, particularly one without the stature that comes with having been cited hundreds of times, which by the way is about three people have been cited many times, if you remember from my slide. Um, I think there is a strong bias towards the status quo and whatever the status quo may be in your particular area of inquiry. So my concern here is as much about the fact that we have not had a, the the underlying architecture of a genuine scientific debate where each side engages the other, as evidenced by the fact that the sides are not citing each other, um, that I worry about that much more than I might worry about um, industry influence. Not to say that industry influence might not matter, and as I said, I did not look at that, and perhaps it does matter. Um, but I think even if that mattered, I think there wouldn't be just one of several factors. 